And then hello and welcome to part two. Say hello. Hi. Okay, now I'll pause it. Okay, now back really to your part two. Thank you, Georgina. Okay, so part two, uh, personality. Again, now these last ones we looked at the psychoanalytical of Freud and his idea of what a personality is. And these two notes, or, or so this notes, we're gonna be looking at two humanistic and trait perspective of again, why you have the personality that you do. So humanistic, we're gonna go back to Carl Rogers, I'm sorry, Abram Maslow first and then Carl Rogers. So remember Abram um, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. So this is actually a good review. So remember the hierarchy needs I had you guys kind of um, look at what you thought it was, but that basic, let me make it bigger right now. So your basic needs are um, safety, food, um, having a happy place to live, and that if you didn't have these basic needs that you couldn't get onto the safety needs, and then the belonging, the esteem, and then the top one, the self-actualization. So Maslow, when trying to describe personality, he kind of started from, sorry, the top there. Um, so he was saying that that self-actualization, the fulfilling our potential, is what drives us to have the personality that we do. So how um, how we go to about filling our, fulfilling our potential ultimately determines what type of personality that we have. Now, Maslow is a little different from Freud in that he's a humanistic psychologist. So humanistic, remember we said, is like, kind of like the hippie feel good. He focused on um, healthy people, health, healthily, that's fun. There we go, all right. Um, healthy people. So he did all of his studies on personality on people that um, the 99% not in therapy, where Freud focused on the abnormal. Um, and he had uh, what's called the third force perspective, uh, meaning, that, meaning that there's other forces that uh, come into play when determining personality. Uh, they called it, so uh, Maslow and Rogers called theirs the third force perspective, meaning that you're supposed to look through the eyes of the person and not necessarily through the eyes of the researcher. So let me back out that a little bit. So instead of being the researcher looking at trying to figure out the personality traits of the person, that personality traits should be more self-reported, looking at them through the eyes of what the person is saying. Uh, and again, Maslow and Rogers are, are, are humanistic um, people here. And so uh, what they said is that these peak experiences that occur throughout our life um, that surpass our ordinary consciousness, so that come about from self-actualization, are really the things that determine our personality. So they're these like defining moments, not necessarily like this set of, of, of characteristics that goes with this. Okay, so that's my Maslow, getting through my hierarchy of needs. Um, my other one, Rogers, remember he, uh, again, humanistic. He uh, had the person-centered perspective. So Rogers, feel good, right, acceptance, caring. He uh, was someone that looked at personality from a growth perspective, and he said that in order for people to um, have a climate in which they can grow and become the personalities that they are, that they needed three things. That they needed a genuine climate, somewhere where they're open, where people could uh, talk about things openly. Acceptance, which we'll go down to the bottom, is our unconditional positive regard. And then empathy from uh, the climate. Empathy meaning that <clears throat> uh, being able to share feelings, to mirror feelings, and to empathize or understand with what people are going through. So Carl Rogers believed in unconditional positive regard, unconditional meaning that not wavering, um, and, and this is what promoted the attitude of total self-acceptance. So most parents have unconditional positive regard for their children. No matter what happens, they're completely accepting of the people that they are. And remember back into our notes when we talked about self-concept, this is a little bit of a review. So Carl Rogers was saying that the personality really comes through in someone's self-confidence concept, what you think about yourself, being able to answer the question, who am I, and give personality traits, and really look at that growth in terms of who you are versus who you ideally want to be is where we'd get the growth. And again, the growth only occurs if you have those three things in your uh, environment. All right, so that's the person-centered perspective uh, versus Maslow, the self-actualizing person. So how do we actually assess the self on personality? There's a couple different ways uh, we can do this. Remember Freud talked about free association and getting to know personality. And humanistic most reports are self-test. So they're self-reported of your personality traits. And where the conflict occurs is looking at when you, when you answer a multiple choice question or trait 
about yourself. Uh, where What are you answering? Are you answering where you ideally want to be or where you actually are? So your actual self versus your ideally want to be. We'll talk about some things that researchers have done to get around that conundrum of, of reporting the ideal versus the self. But um, ways, so when we look at the humanistic perspective from self-reported personality trait, uh, remember we get back to that renewed interest in the self-concept that it's all about what you think about yourself and your ideals that ultimately determine your personality. Now the criticisms, again that it's uh, self-reported is one of them, is that it tends to be a vague and subjective way to look at personalities, meaning that if I'm just reporting to you my personality types and talking about these, my self-concept, that is very hard or subjective to, to compare across the spectrum. Right? How do I, how do I not have a multiple choice test? How do I look at what people report and decide what type of personality they have? And that it's naive to think that people would report the truth versus reporting what they want people to hear. And it's individual, individualistic and Western biased, meaning that we've talked about culture before. In the Western culture, very much focused on the self, uh, independent of the surroundings. Okay, so the other theory, so we've looked at psychoanalytical and the humanistic perspective, is now we're going to look at the trait theory. And this is probably the one where you guys are more familiar with, especially if you took social psych. And trait theory of personality looks to look at traits and say that we have multiple traits. So a trait, going back to personality, so characteristic patterns um, or a deposition to feel or act uh, and again, they are self-reported inventories uh, and peer reports. So traits are self-reported or peer reported, characteristic patterns of behavior, and they look to describe rather than explain. So Freud was a big explanation guy, right? Like he wanted to explain why you act the way you do. The trait personality theory says to describe the traits, not necessarily explain why you have them. So think about if I was trying to, the example is, um, if I'm trying to categorize apples and I don't know how to start, right? So instead of saying like golden delicious and red delicious, like you might start with like these are red, and that these are green, that they're all different somehow, even when I look at all the green ones, but I can start putting them into these categories that define or that are defined by, by a set of traits. The Greeks did this um, thousands of years ago and they actually defined people under four categories depressed, cheerful, unemotional, or irritable. So those are their traits that you would fall into. It's pretty narrow categories. And the, the Myers-Briggs test is a, a type of trait personality test that looks at, and we'll look at this in a second, um, looks at your type or indicates your type. So the Myers-Briggs test, um, Actually, we'll do that one in class. So here's another, so exploring traits, the factor analysis. Here's how factor analysis works when I'm trying to look at personality traits. Um, what it does is it looks at this self-reported inventory and it clusters the things that happen to occur together a lot. So I don't like loud noises, uh, true. Uh, I like to read silently to myself, true. And so it looked how, how often these traits were kind of reported together. And um, Isaac and Isaac um, came up with this type of chart. I'll look, show you in just a second. Uh, that really, you've probably heard of this being an extrovert or an introvert, um, or being stable versus unemotional. And their personality questionnaire was used to rank people on this scale. So first of all, they looked at from their test if someone was an introvert versus an extrovert. Extrovert's going to be like outgoing um, personality. Introvert wants to be alone. They are then classified as either unstable or stable, and then all the characteristical traits went in between. So if you were an introvert and unstable, you would have these type of traits. If you were unstable and extrovert, you would have those type of traits. If you are a stable introvert, those traits would define you. Extrovert and stable, those traits would define you. All right, so those are the clustered of traits. Your, so this is one way, so exploring traits under factor analysis is one way to look at personality types and the characteristics that define them. Another one is looking at our, uh, our biology. So they took this introvert extroverts and, and went a little bit further. So people that were self-reported introverts or extroverts, what they found is from anyone that was to be a reported extrovert, that they had um, lower amounts of brain um, uh, activity. 
right in their frontal lobe. So they did the brain scans and they were looking at activity and what they found is people who are extroverts have low activity normally. So they're seeking to be aroused more. So they're looking for companionship. They're out looking for uh, things to do. Uh, so that's one explanation of why people are extroverted versus introvert. And then um, the genetics. So you are genetically pre-wired in your autonomic nervous system. Uh, how how reactive you are to things. Remember your autonomic things that automatically happen, your heartbeat, your breathing, um, digestion, things like that. So your automatic nervous system has different amount of reactivity and that could dispose you to a type of personality trait. Okay, let's look a little bit more on assessing our traits. A few more slides. So another personality inventory is called the MMPI, which is the, min oops, sorry, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. A little bit longer, so this is an inventory versus a test. It's longer, it assesses a wide range, and it assesses several traits at once. So I guess I should go back to that. Myers-Briggs, you just took the introvert test and the extrovert test and the stable and the unstable. They were separate tests looking for different traits. Uh, this is a longer inventory, so looking at a lot of different things. Sometimes it's used for um, hiring purposes, so some uh, companies make you take a personality test. And um, what's different about this, again, that it's longer, assesses several traits, but it's empirically derived data. So remember empirical meaning like scientific, and it tests a pool of items and it looks for the, the questions that discriminate between groups. Okay, so it's scientifically proven. It's very objective. A computer grades this test. It's not subjective, right? So, or subjective means like different people have different um, interpretations. An objective test means like it's right or wrong or introvert, extrovert. Um, just because it's objective doesn't mean that it's valid, but it is more objective. But these tests have certain, they're called lie questions in there. And they're questions meant to see if the person is lying about their personality traits. So for instance, I gave you an example down here. They would have the question in there, I get angry sometimes. This is a universally true statement. So most people should answer true for this. But sometimes you're taking a test and you're looking to see what if they don't want me to ever get angry. And so you might answer false. So they have these lie scale questions that are looking to see if you're lying on this test or that if you're being honest. So that's a personality inventory. Um, what it looks to that from these personality inventories, they come out with something called the big five factor. Uh, here are your big five traits that they're looking for to rank on this test. So uh, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extrovert. And so you'll get this chart and I'll have you copy this in class. So here are my big five personality traits. It says memory tip. Picturing a canoe will help you recall these later. So the C-A-N-O-E is the trait dimension and you need to know these. So to have a C trait, this is your conscientiousness, uh, the endpoints of the dimensions. So you either organize or disorganize. So those are my extremes. You're careful or you're careless. You're disciplined or you're impulsive, right? So that would be my C. The agreeableness, soft or ruthless, trusting, suspicious, helpful or uncooperative. My N, calm, anxious, secure, insecure, self-satisfying, self-pitying, openness, imagination, practical, preference to routine, to variety, independent and conforming. And then my E, this is my extroversion, am I sociable or am I retiring, fun, loving or sober, affectionate or reserved. So it ranks you on these big five factors of your personality. Okay, so this is something like the Minnesota inventory would look to do. Now, the questions on the big five is looking at, remember I asked you guys this in class, like for personality, how stable are the traits? Are they traits that you're born with and have throughout the rest of your life? Do they change as you get older? Are they something you're inherently born with and you will forever be? How uh, heritable are the traits? Are, you, are these from your environment or do you um, inherit them? Uh, to what extent can they be changed? And do they predict other personal attributes? That's the biggest one I think to me, Liz. Well, if someone says that you're an extrovert and <clears throat> socially outgoing and uh, you know, you're ranked this on this test, what does that mean about how, what type of student you'll be, about what type of worker you'll be? So how much do our personality tests actually sh um, show to affect the people that we are in our day-to-day -day basis? Okay, so that's gonna be the end of our part two notes looking at humanistic perspective with Carl Rogers and Abram Maslow.
looking at the trait perspective that we should look at personality in these different traits and ranking them and we'll do some of those in class tomorrow and then looking at those big five uh, at the end and asking those questions of whether or not uh, our traits or personality are consistent or there's something they're able to change. All right, you guys have a good night. I'll talk to you later.